Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, for you, those of you that don't know me, my name is Anthony. Um, I grew up here. I'm currently going to Central Valley Church, but it's really good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I, <laughs> um, I actually thought I was going to be singing at a nursing home, but this is much better um, and a lot more <laughs> nerve-wracking, to be honest. <laughs> Do I use this mic? Tears are falling, hearts are breaking how we need to hear from God. You've been promised, we've been waiting. Welcome, holy child. Welcome, holy child. <clears throat> Hope that you don't mind our manger. How I wish we could have known A long-awaited holy stranger Make yourself at home Please make yourself at home Bring your peace into our violence bid our hungry souls be filled word now breaking heaven's silence welcome to our world welcome to our world fragile fingers sent to heal us Tender brow prepare for thorn. Tiny heart whose blood will save us. Unto us is born. Unto us is born. <laughs> so wrap our injured flesh around you, breathe our air, mark our sign, rob our sins and make us holy, perfect Son of God, perfect Son of God, welcome to Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful song. Amen. Amen. So happy to see Anthony here and Becky Messer and Mike Carter. Praise the Lord in Ezra. So we have some members of Fresno Central who are not here today, but we are blessed to have some members from Central Valley Church. So welcome. We're so happy that you're here. And I know you have an amazing speaker at Central Valley. So today, you're going to hear somebody with a Portuguese accent, okay? So just, you know, just bear with me. But I'm also very happy and thankful to God to see everyone here today, all the members, visitors that regularly attend our church and those who are starting to come. And I was very happy to see Joseph here. I don't know where he is. Joseph, where are you? Uh, he probably left, but he was here with Marley. Joseph is going to be baptized. Oh, there he is. He's in the children's room in the back. Hi. <laughs> so if you want to look back, he's there waving. Joseph is a great friend. We've been studying the Bible together for years. And uh, Joseph is going to be baptized this coming Sabbath. He's very excited, and I'm very excited. You should be very excited. Amen? Yeah. So pray for him. 
Joseph is a wonderful, wonderful man. I just love him so much, and I praise the Lord that he brought him to my life. Now, I know this, we are entering the Christmas season. I know that. I know that you are expecting to hear Christmas season sermons, but I always disappoint people, okay? So I'm going to disappoint you today. It's not a Christmas sermon. Sorry, it's not. Because last week, as I was preaching, there was somebody, a brother who was watching online, who had a question. And that question really challenged me. Because he put it in a, in a way that, you know, that made me think. I have been a pastor for 17 years. 17 years. You know how many sermons that is? It's not only one sermon a Sabbath. There's one sermon every Sabbath, one ser sermon every Wednesday. Sometimes I will have evangelistic uh, meetings or revival series where I have a sermon every night, sometimes two or three sermons in a day. So imagine the sermons that I have preached. Just make the math. I've preached thousands of sermons, and I have never preached on this topic that this brother was talking about. And he was like, why is it that this topic is so taboo in Adventism? And I thought, he's right. I talked about it, and I answered questions privately, but we never preach about it. So today I'm going to talk about predestination in the Bible. Okay? You ready? Let's pray so that the Lord may help us. I really need the help of God today. I pray that the Lord may help me, and I ask you to please be praying for me as I share, okay? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can be together as family and friends. Thank you for those who are watching online, even for those who sent in important questions. I pray that your Holy Spirit may guide us as I present your word, Lord, may you help people to forget about me, really focus in the Bible, and may we believe what you want us to believe. May each and every one of us find the reasons for his or her beliefs in your written word, and may we all come closer to the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name, amen. Predestination in the Bible. I don't know if this is going to be a sermon, okay? Um, just pray for me. You know, in the holidays, there's a new concept that is coming. I've heard it that is called, families normally do a movie marathon. Have you heard about it? Are you, you're not going to say it because you're at church. So, But there's a lot of people that when it's the holidays, they join the family and say, let's do a movie mar marathon. You know what that means, right? They sit down and they watch movies until they drop, until they fall asleep or until they just can't stand it anymore. Now, when we watch movies like that, it's probably not very good for our faith, right? Today, I'm going to challenge you. I want you to, to grab a piece of paper and a pen or get your phones out. It's okay. I'll, I'll let you have your phones out today for this purpose. I want you to take notes. I want you to take notes of, of the Bible passages that I'm going to quote. I'm probably not going to be able to quote everything that I want. But I want you to read the, these for yourself. This sermon is going to be just a challenge. I was challenged. I am challenging you now and those at home to make annotations and to read and study this for yourselves in the Bible. It used to be, hi, Renee, so happy that you're back. All right. It used to be that Seventh-day Adventist preachers would say, I want you to believe this for yourself. Check it in the Bible. And we've lost that habit. We should, right? What you believe should be here. Amen. Amen? Thus says the Lord. What you believe should come from the Bible. So today... We're going to do a Bible passage marathon, okay? This is going to be great for your faith. Movie marathon is not good for your faith, but a Bible passage marathon will be great for your faith if you do it with prayer. So I'm going to give you a lot from the Bible that I want you to read, okay? And we start in the Old Testament. This idea of predestination in the Bible 
um, is something that is a long debate. It's, a, it's an old and very controversial topic in Christianity. Some people believe that God chooses some people to be saved, and he chooses other people to be lost. That's called double pr predestination, okay? They believe that long ago in eternity, God has chosen some of us to be saved and some of us human beings to be eternally lost, period. That's what they believe. That's a very extreme view of predestination. And if you believe that, in my opinion, you are believing in a God that is a tyrant because he's saying, I'm going to choose some to be saved and some to be lost just because I want, period. And it is true that God can do whatever he wants, right? However, if God chooses some to be lost and he chooses some to be saved, then that's all that we believe and that's all that we say. Our idea of God is like a tyrant, you know? Because arbitrarily, he's just going to choose whoever he wants to be saved and choose whoever he wants to be lost. At the other end of the spectrum, and that's where our church probably has erred a few times, we say, salvation is up to you. You choose if you want to be saved or not. Whatever you want, that's what God is going to confirm at the end. He's just going to sign your decision. And we are putting salvation, we are putting the emphasis of salvation in us. Like we are the Lord, the Lords of our salvation. That's not biblical either. In the Bible, salvation is of the Lord. Anybody who is saved is going to be saved because God saved him. Amen? And that God did a lot of things to save him or her. Amen? So let's read what the Bible has to say about these concepts of predestination, about election. That's a word that is connected to predestination. And um, God choosing people, okay? Did God choose men and women in the Bible, yes or no? Yes, yes. look at uh, Genesis chapter 18. Remember the story of Abraham? Did God choose Abraham? Mm -hmm. I believe he did. Look at Genesis 18, verse 16 through 19 says, Then the men rose from there. These were the three um, angelic beings that appeared to Abraham when they were about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and one of them was more than an angel. Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Verse 18, Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations on the earth shall be blessed in him. Did God choose Abraham? Yes. Did God choose Abraham for the purpose of blessing everybody on earth? Yes or no? Yes, yes it's there. Look at verse 19. For I have known him. Now, some translations say, I have chosen him. Okay? But actually, I'm reading the New King James. This is more literal. I have known him. It's a word yada. That means a really personal, very intimate knowledge. I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, the English st Standard Version says, I have chosen him. The Common English Bible says, I have formed a relationship with him. See, whatever you believe about predestination, you have to still believe what the Bible says about God being love. Amen? Amen. The Bible says God is love. And when God chooses a man or a woman for a special mission, God is interested in more than the salvation of that man or woman. He's interested in using him or her to the salvation of many. And God is not only interested in the people that he's going to save through that man or that woman, God is interested in having a relationship with that person. God has known Abraham, meaning that God has loved Abraham. God has entered a relationship with Abraham. Now imagine this. Would you want to have a relationship with a God that 
Since eternity, he would have already chosen if you're going to die or if you're going to live just out of his own arbitrary choice. Said, hmm, I'm going to destroy this one and I'm going to save his child. That's just because I want to. Come on. It's beyond that, okay? God wants to enter a relationship with you. And how can you enter a relationship of love with God if you don't believe that you can truly love him out of your own free will? Now, a lot of people that believe predestination are very careful to say, we don't really have free will. Well, let's read the Bible, okay? And we'll see what the Bible says. I do believe that God somehow created human beings with a capacity of entering a relationship with him and loving him without being forced to love him. Because if you are forced to love God, then what kind of relationship is that, right? Noah, did Noah, was Noah chosen by God, yes or no? Look at Genesis chapter 6. Let's read a little bit about, you know, remember Genesis chapter 6. God decides to destroy the earth. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man. This is verse 7. Genesis 6, verse 7 through 9. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah, verse 9. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Question, did God choose Noah, yes or no? Yes. Was the world completely corrupted? Was God going to destroy everybody? What was the difference concerning Noah? The Bible tells us that Noah was a righteous man and he walked with God. Clearly, there was, a, there was a very big distinction between Noah, who was walking with God, and the other people. So why would God choose Noah? Well, I believe also that somehow Noah also chose God. Amen? But let's continue. Did God choose Israel, the people of Israel, yes or no? Yes, God had a purpose. He chose the people of Israel. He chose Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob came, from Jacob came the 12 tribes, remember? Now look at Exodus chapter 19. God had delivered people, the people of Israel from uh, Egypt, and God now wants to enter a special relationship, a special covenant with the people, wants to establish a covenant with the people. Look at verse 5. This is Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel." Was God giving a choice to the people of Israel, yes or no? God chose them. God wanted them to be his people. God delivered them from the slavery of Egypt. But did God force them to be his people? God invited them to enter a covenant relationship with him. Amen? Now, in Exodus chapter 33, you find an an important and special passage that the Apostle Paul quotes in the New Testament concerning election. That is the passage when God reveals himself to Moses because Moses asks that God will show him his glory. Look at Exodus 33, verse 18 and 19. Moses was struggling and wrestling with God. God had said that the people, you know, that the people had sinned. He could no longer go in the middle of the people. He would send an angel. And Moses was like, no, Lord, you have to come with us. And God said he would. And verse 18, Moses says, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. 
I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, some people, when they read this verse, and when they read this passage, especially in Romans chapter 9, quoted by Paul, they put the emphasis on humanity, okay? Some are lost, some are saved. When I believe that the emphasis here is really on God, God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Is God good, yes or no? Would God be good if arbitrarily he would choose to condemn some and save others? I will make all my goodness pass before you. God is good. God is love. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will ha have compassion on whom I will have compassion. To me, before anything, this passage is telling me that God is free to do what he wants. Is God free to do what he wants, yes or no? We need to put some weight on the other side of the balance here. God is free to do what he wants. God is free to condemn whom he wants to condemn and save whom he wants to save, yes or no? God has created human beings and angels at his image and likeness. Angels are free moral agents too. Actually, I'm going to read, if we get there today, I'm going to read an interesting verse in the Bible. But anyways, God has created human moral agents that are free, but God is free too. Yes or no? Yes. God is free to love you or not if he wants to love you or not. The problem is that God, not problem, the blessing, the great thing is that God is love. Yes. It's very hard to make the argument that God does not love some. Actually, the Bible presents a lot of evidence to say that God loves everybody. But let's continue. Look at uh, the experience of Saul. Did God choose Saul, the first king of, king of uh, Israel? Yes. yes or no? Yes, yes he chose him. Did, did he not choose him? Right. Yes, he did. Now, question. Did Saul reject the plan of God for his life? Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10 and 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me. Now question, did God make a mistake when he chose Saul? No. Does God make mistakes? He chose Saul. Did Saul have the potential to be a great king? Yes or no? Yes, in the beginning he did some awesome things. But he turned away. Somehow, Saul had the ability of turning away from the purpose of God for his life. Now look at the election of David. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you know, Samuel was very sad because uh, Saul had turned away from the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, this is 1 Samuel 16, 1. How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from, be, from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Did God choose David, yes or no? Yes, yes he chose David among the sons of Jesse for a special purpose. See, you don't read here, I have chosen David for salvation, but you read here, I have chosen him to be king, right? Now look at verse 6 and 7 in 1 Samuel 16. Now it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or, or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Did God choose David, yes or no? Yes. yes. Did God choose David because he was looking at his heart, yes or no? Yes. The choices that you make in life, the character that you develop in life, by God's grace, of course, will enable God to choose you for special missions or not. Well, look at Jeremiah. Now, this is powerful, okay? You ready? 
Breathe deep, Seventh-day Adventists, because this can challenge you a little bit, okay? Breathe deep. <laughs> Hi, Fifi. Nice to have you here. All right. Um, look at Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Amen? Amen. Does God have a foreknowledge of every human being? Yes or no? God knows everything. God already knew that you would be born where you were, you, where you were born. You would be the child of your dad and your mom. You would live in the generation that you live. You would interact with the people that you interact. And you would make the choices that you make, even though he's giving you all the grace in the world and in the universe for you to be saved. You are still somehow able to accept or to reject his plan. And he knew that beforehand. God knows beforehand. God knew Jeremiah beforehand, and he chose Jeremiah beforehand to be a prophet to the nations. Now, did Jeremiah accept his calling? Yes or no? Yes, yes but we have evidence in the Bible that if he wanted to, he could have re rejected. Look at Jeremiah 17, 16. The New American Standard Bible says, But as for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd following after you. Jeremiah was suffering. He was being persecuted. His ministry was not popular. But he is talking to God, and he's saying, hey, I did not reject your calling, right? Because you can reject the calling of God, and I'm going to show you that in the Bible today. Now, look at the New Testament. Do you have election in the New Testament and predestination? Yes. But let's read it in the Bible. In Matthew 24, this great chapter that Seventh-day Adventists like a lot about the second coming of Jesus, the signs of the second coming of Jesus, the destruction of Jerusalem was a miniature of the destruction of the world. The signs that were uh, preceding the destruction of Jerusalem were a miniature of the signs that precede the second coming. Look at Matthew 24, verses 22 through 24. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, do God, does God have elect on earth at the second coming? Yes or no? Yes. Does God have a people on earth will be ready to see Jesus face to face? Yes or no? Yes. yes. For the elect's sake, for the sake of those who are alive on earth and who want to love God, trust God, obey God's commandments, have the faith of Jesus on earth at that time. Because of them, those days will be shortened. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. What is this passage saying? This passage is saying that there is a people on earth at the end times among, amongst great deceptions, amongst great signs and catastrophes that will be faithful to God. And God's going to protect them. Yes or no? Yes. Verse 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of, of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. First Thessalonians tells us the rest of the story. The angels will gather all the elect of God, not only the living, but by the words and power and voice of Christ, the dead in Christ will be raised, and all together they will ascend to meet the Lord in the air. Amen? Amen. So yes, the elect will be saved, but this is what the, this passage means, okay? There's, there's nothing more here. Let's go to Romans 8, 28 through 30. Romans 8, 28 through 30. 
We like to quote verse 28, and we're afraid of 29 and 30, but we should not be. It's in the Bible. It's for us, and it's a blessing. Romans 8, 28 through 30, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Amen? Has God predestined, has God predetermined that everything will work for good in the lives of those who love God, yes or no? But for the lives of those who love God, do you think that God would be God? God would be the loving God, the Father of, this, of Jesus, who gave his Son to die for our sins. Would he be love if he would force you to love him? So God makes all things work together for good to those who what? Who love him. Now, you have to be free to love or else you're not loving. You cannot love someone if you are not free to love that person. Those who love God, to those who are called, does God call people, yes or no? But who, who does he call? Those who choose to love him. Those who love God are those who are called according to his purpose. Does God have an everlasting purpose to save human beings, yes or no? Yes, he does. Those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Friends, I, have, I am not afraid to say that God has foreknew, God has chosen, God has called, God has predestined people to be saved. Amen? I cannot be afraid of saying that because it's in the Bible. I also am not afraid to say that God loves me so much that God would not force me to love him. God would not choose to give me more opportunities to love him and save me because of that and not give the same opportunities or judge me, exact, judge me exactly the same way that he would judge a person that did not have the same opportunities that I had to love him, to choose to love him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's continue reading. The Bible says that nobody can bring a charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Why? Because they, they've given themselves to Christ. That's Romans 8, 33. But the main passage with, 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 with which people struggle is Romans chapter 9. Okay? Or Romans chapter, you can actually say Romans chapter 8, 28 through the end of Romans chapter 11. It's the main or one of the main passages that people struggle with, okay? Now, I cannot read everything to you. I'm going to give you some, some pointers, and I'm going to read some passages in this passage that, to me, allow me to believe what I believe and, and tell you with a clear conscience that I believe what the Bible says about predestination, Okay? I'm going to give you some hints, and I'm going to give them from the Bible. First of all, Paul, in this passage, in this book that, where he is talking about justification by faith, Paul is talking about the fact that the Israel was blinded. Israel rejected Christ as the Messiah. He's actually saying that he would even give his eternal life, he would be willing to lose eternal life if his uh, countrymen, if, he, if the Israelites would be saved, okay? That's how much he loved them, even though they hated him and were persecuting him. And he was, he was talking about the fact that the Gentiles, for the Gentiles to be saved, Israel was blinded so the Gentiles would be saved, the gospel would be preached to the Gentiles, and many would be saved. But at the end, God would still call many of the Israelites back to him. This is the context, okay? Now look, Romans 9, verse 6. 
But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not Israel, they are not all Israel, who are of Israel. Nor are they all children, because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that God had promised a son to Abraham through Sarah. That was his legitimate child. And that was the child of the promise. That was the child of the miracle. Because just as Isaac was born out of a miracle, out of a promise, any true believer in Christ is born out of a miracle that God does. This is why we say, and we should always say, that salvation belongs to the Lord. Yes, you are free to choose to love God or not, but you are free because of the miracle that God does, not only in creating you, but through Christ in giving you that freedom. See, Jesus says, I'm just going to give it away. I, mean, I was saving this for the end of the sermon, but I don't know if I'll get there, so I'm just going to give it away, okay? Okay. In John chapter 8, you have to read this, okay? John chapter 8, 31 through 36, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you what? Free, right? And the Jews were like, oh, we, we've never been in bondage, bondage to anyone. We're children of Abraham. Jesus says, everyone who commits sin is what? A slave of sin. So do we have free will, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes and no. You, are you a sinner? Have you ever committed any sin? Yes or no? So as sinners, we are born in this world as slaves. Slaves to sin, to Satan, and to death. But through Christ, we are all given the opportunity to be free from that slavery. Does the Bible say that Jesus was only killed and crucified for the elect? Does the Bible say that? Does the Bible say that Jesus only died for, for the sinners that will repent and go to heaven? Does the Bible say that? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. I hope you're taking notes because I'm not going to read everything. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says that Christ is the propitiation for our sins, believers... And not only for our sins, but for the sins of what? The whole world. So, just as Isaac was a miracle, just as the descendants of Abraham literally was called upon Isaac, was called from Isaac because he was a miracle, true believers are those that through faith in Christ, by the grace of God, are saved. And that is... Not a, smaller, not a smaller miracle, that is a greater miracle, okay? He says, verse 12, about Jacob and Esau. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And, and Paul's going to say, verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Verse 17, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Now, this is the passage, or one of the passages, that a lot of believers struggle with. And of course, many believe, well, okay, I have to believe predestination is in the Bible. God hardens the people he wants to harden, and God has mercy on the ones that he wants to have mercy. But please, when you, whenever you read a passage... Don't read just that passage. Read a little bit before and read after, okay? Remember, I want you to read at least until the end of chapter 11, 
okay? You will go through chapter 10 that speaks about evangelism and the importance of the gospel being preached, okay? And what, what, what business would we have preaching the gospel and doing evangelism if everything is already predetermined? See, this idea, if everything is completely set in stone by God from eternity and people, whatever they do, whatever they believe or not believe, they will be saved or lost by an everlasting decree, why would we preach the gospel? Why would we talk to people about Jesus? See, the devil is very smart, friends, and he wants to interpret the Bible in a way that suits his plans. Now, when the Bible says that God raised Pharaoh for this purpose and he hardened his heart for his purpose, what purpose? To destroy Pharaoh? What is the purpose? That I, may, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. It's not talking about the salvation or perdition of the Pharaoh. It's talking about the purpose that God had that through that hard heart, God would show his power in all the earth. You know that the Bible in the book of Exodus says many times that God will harden the, the Pharaoh's heart and other times the Bible says that the Pharaoh hardened his heart, okay? Salvation, oh, I hope I can get to that text today. Salvation is a work of grace from God, but it involves cooperation from the human agent. God is not going to force you to work with him. God does everything for you and in you, yes, but God wants you to work with that everything that he is doing because you can reject that if you want to. Okay, let's just go there. Let's go to Philippians, okay? Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm just going to jump around all my <laughs> notes because um, the clock is ticking. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. I love this Bible text. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Salvation, is it of God or of men? He's saying here, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Question, are we saved by the grace of God, yes or no? Are we saved by the power of God, yes or no? Do we have a part in that salvation, yes or no? It says here, work out your own salvation because it is God who is working in you. Can we say, I don't know if you agree with me, but can we say that salvation, it's a work of cooperation between God who became a man to die for man's sins and women's sins. In this day and age, I always have to be careful with my words, right? Men and women, okay? <laughs> and humanity, and humanity is ultimately, the human agent is ultimately, ultimately saved if the human agent accepts that love and salvation and works with God in cooperation with what God is doing. From the human agent, you will always see imperfection because we are dust. From God, the work is perfect. But to say that we have nothing to say or to do concerning our salvation, I think that that is to say something against the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, you may ask, so pastor, you're telling me that John, who wrote the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, was not okay with Paul, and Paul was against John, and they were preaching different things? No. Let's go back to Romans. Look at chapter 10. Because, you know, if you read Romans chapter 9 and you arrive to certain conclusions, you cannot possibly believe that 
Paul in chapter 10 and chapter 11 would now contradict what he said in chapter 9. So whatever Paul said in chapter 9, you have to make it agree with what he is going to say in chapter 10, verse 8 through 13. Romans 10, 8 through 13. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Do you have to believe to be saved? Yes or no? He who, who, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, said, said Jesus in Mark 16, right? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Personal faith in your heart, public expression with baptism whenever possible will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This was written by the same author that wrote, wrote Romans chapter 9. He was, reading, he was re writing to Romans chapter 10. There were no chapters, no verse numbers when he wrote it. He was just following his reasoning. Whatever he wrote in chapter 9, even though it's mysterious, and I, I have to agree, it's not easy to interpret, Whatever he wrote in chapter 9, you have to make it agree with what he wrote in chapter 10. Verse 11, uh, chapter 11, chapter 11, verses 19 through 23. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in, meaning the Gentiles. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Paul was preaching determinism in Romans chapter 9, how would he write this in Romans chapter 11? Because of in belief they were broken off and you stand by faith, do not be haughty, but fear. Could people be haughty? Could people lose their fear of God? Yes, that's why he's calling them, do not be haughty, but fear. For, God, for if God did not spare the natural branches. He may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness. You know, this business of this extreme view of predestination, the double predestination, so-called de determinism also, is dangerous because you may think that if you're saved, you come to church, you believe in Jesus, you read your Bible, so you're saved. So once saved, forever saved, because God already decreed that I'm going to be saved, period. That is very dangerous. God is saying through the Apostle Paul, if you continue, right, if you continue in his goodness, as we're in Romans chapter 11, okay, we have not left that problematic passage. We're still there, and it's giving us answers. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you, will also, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Will God save a, an Israelite that gives himself to Jesus? Yes or no? Oh, yes, an Israelite, a Portuguese, an American, a French person, a white, a black, a yellow, a red person, whoever believes in the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. Amen. Amen? Well, yes, we have to match those truths with the truths of predestination. 
Let's read Ephesians chapter 1. I cannot read it every, everything. I'm going to leave a lot. If you want my notes, email me, call me. I'll give you, you'll just be reading Bible. Okay, that's what I have here. Ephesians 1, verses one, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, friends, I could continue. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. 1 Timothy 5, 21. Everything t talks about God choosing people to save them. But we have to put that in balance with the other affirmations of Scripture. Let me read this last one that I talked about to you. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. This is interesting because it's not going to talk about people. It's talking about angels. Look at this. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is 1 Timothy 5.21. And the elect, what? Angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Are there elect angels, yes or no? Were they elect because they sinned, or are they elect because they remain faithful to God? What? They remain faithful to God when some other angels sin. See, if you look at election, and you believe in determinism and that God has fixed the destiny of angels and human beings out of an arbitrary choice, then you will believe that God made Satan, made Lucifer sin. You have to be careful, right? Because God, the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, created him perfect. You were perfect in your ways until iniquity was found in you. God did not put iniquity there. God allowed him to be free to choose to follow him and serve him or not. That's the price of love. And he was free and he used that freedom to rebel against God. Now, I have to read. I'm going to leave many of the texts that I have. And I know some texts are not easy to read and to interpret. But I have to read a few texts before we go home today, okay? Are you, uh, the last text was in... Um, I don't know, let me see here. Where, okay, 1 Timothy 5.21. 1 Timothy 5.21. Now, if you want all the texts that I have on predestination, call me, uh, text me, email me. I'll be, fr I'll be happy to give you. But I want to read some texts that people sometimes don't associate with predestination, but they're also in the Bible. So we have to believe it. John 6, verses 37 through 40, to me... Help me to make sense of predestination in the Bible, okay? John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. All that the Father gives me, said Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Whatever you believe on predestination, believe this. If you come to Jesus... No matter who you are, no matter how much, how much evil you have done, you come to Jesus, it is God who is bringing you, and he will accept you. Be careful with this doctrine. This extreme view of predestination sometimes makes people believe, well, there's no hope for me. I'm lost. I'm never going to make it. Don't believe that. That's the devil speaking. You come to Jesus. He will never cast you out. For I have come down from heaven, verse 38, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And we have verse 39 and 40 to read. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, 
I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. If we had only verse 39, we could say, well, there, here it is. The Father has chosen some. He brings them to Jesus, and they are saved. Well, we have verse 42. Verse 40 as well. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Can we say that God has predetermined, God has predestined that everyone on earth who believes in Jesus will be saved? Yes or no? This, I have to believe so, and I'm going to tell you why. Because of these passages, look. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 says, this is Paul preaching in Athens to the uh, Greek philosophers. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands who? He commands all men everywhere to repent. Has God chosen some to be saved? Yes. Has God chosen some to be saved arbitrarily? No. God commands all men everywhere to repent. God is commanding you, repent of your sins. Come to me, come to me. God is drawing you. The Bible say, says, John chapter 16, verse 8, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It doesn't say he will convict the elect. The Holy Spirit is trying to draw all to Jesus. If you can resist that, but he is trying to do it. He is doing everything he can because God commands all men everywhere to repent. It doesn't say a few. It doesn't say the elect. All men everywhere. First Timothy, you have to write down these in your notes. You have to underline this in your Bible. Whatever you believe about predestination, that's okay. Just make it match or make it agree with First Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4. For this is good, meaning he was talking about men praying everywhere. And he's going to say to Timothy, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants who to be saved? This is the paradox that you will go, get into if you believe that God has chosen some, just out of his own free will, arbitrarily has chosen some to be saved and some to be lost, no matter what they do in life, it's already predetermined. But then the Bible says that he wants everybody to be saved. So you will fall into this paradox that to me, it's, you know, makes no sense. You would say that God is not strong enough to save everybody. Because he wants to save everybody. And if he can give a decree to save everybody, why wouldn't he do so? See, God respects your choice. God will respect your choice. If you come to Christ, you will be truly free. That's the, only, that's the true freedom, if you come to Christ. Yes. But how will you come to Christ? The Holy Spirit is trying to draw every man and woman to Christ. Even those that have never heard the name of Jesus, somehow the Holy Spirit is drawing them to God. And if they accept that love and they love God back, even without knowing him as you do, Romans chapter 2 gives us the hint that they will be in heaven and they will find, it, find out in heaven why they can be there because of the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen? Can you reject the purpose of God? Yes or no? Yes. Does God want all men to be saved? Yes or no? Yes. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Is, God, is it God's will that 
potentially everybody is saved. Is it, is it God's will? Yes. Do you believe in a God that loves everybody? Yes. Me too. He wants everybody to be saved. Will everybody be saved? No. no. Why? I'm going to show you a text in the Bible. I was, uh, you know, the God is so good. I have no credit on the, here. I was just about fin uh, finished with my sermon last night, and I got a call from a young pastor who was asking me, he, he told me all his sermon notes in four minutes. He was really, he was like, give me your opinion on this. Do you think I should put something here? And I said, man, that sounds great. So well structured. If you don't preach that, I will preach it. Because my sermon, I don't know where I'm going with all this predestination stuff. And he's saying, oh, really? Yes. So tell me, what, what are you? So I started telling him my ideas. And he was, listen, he said, oh, I'm preaching on the gospel of Luke. And I just came up with a verse here in my mind that I think may speak to the purpose of your sermon. And I was like, really? Yes. And he texted me the verse. Never thought about it, but. It's really very powerful. Luke chapter 7, verse 30. I hope you're taking notes. Luke chapter 7, verse 30. Jesus is talking about John the Baptist preaching. And look at what he says. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not, being, not having been baptized by him. Can you reject the will of God for you? Look at the English Standard Version. I was reading the New King James. They rejected the purpose of God for themselves. Can you reject the purpose of God for you? New Living Translation actually has a very good translation of the word boule in Greek. They rejected God's plan for you, for, for themselves, for them. Can you reject God's plan for you? Brothers and sisters, God has a plan for you, like he has a plan for me. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Can you choose, yes or no? God would be a liar if you would ask you to choose and not give you capacity to choose. You can choose. Yes, God has predestined you for salvation. And you can be saved if you accept that predestination. If you accept that election. If you accept that calling. Revelation chapter 22, this is the end of the Bible. Verse 17 says... And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who durst come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. God wants everybody to be saved. There's a lot of things in the Bible that we don't understand fully. But you know what? This is the beauty. You and I, and you watching at home, we don't need to understand predestination fully. There's things in the mystery of God that we don't need to understand to be saved. Now, in 2002, I fell in love with a woman. Okay? I fell in love with a woman in 2002. I'm still in love with her. 2002. There were many beautiful young women in the camp where, that we attended together, and I could have fallen in love with any other girl. Why would I have fallen in love with that one? Uh, Portugal is a small country, but there's, you know, a few thousand Seventh-day Adventists. There, there were a few thousand beautiful Seventh-day Adventist girls in Portugal when I was, you know, at, at, a, at an age to marry I went into that camp, and my wife actually came into the camp. She was not my wife back then, but we fell in love in that camp. She came into the, that camp, and we had both predetermined in our heart of hearts that we would not date anyone in that camp. We both came brokenhearted, you know. So we did not want a date. We did not want a boyfriend or girlfriend, no. But I don't know. <laughs> 
I looked at her. She looked at me. The, we, are different, we have a different version here. But we fell in love out of all those girls. And unfortunately, I dated a lot of girls before I dated my wife. She dated also other boys. Unfortunately, but we fell in love when we got married. How can you explain that? We cannot fully explain love. God is love. You cannot fully explain his ways in your life, but you can accept his purpose and his plan for you. You can tell him today, Lord, here I am. I don't understand everything, but if I'm here, it's because of your grace. You are drawing me. I want to be drawn. I want to love you back. I want to love you because you loved me first. I want to believe that that bloodshed on the cross was for me, was for the Apostle Paul that had all this theology. I may be a more simpler mind, but it was for me as well because God loves all men and all women. God wants all to be saved. Don't let that blood go to waste in your case. Just come today. Would you like to say, Jesus, I accept your free gift of salvation today, and I want to believe that you have the power to take me to heaven, no matter what happens. Amen? Can I see your hands? Yes or no? Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you had a purpose, an everlasting purpose for your son, Jesus Christ. He came down to earth. He became a human being. He lived a perfect life. He could have fallen. He could have sinned. But he chose to be faithful to you out of love. And because of his faithfulness, because of his sacrifice, because he accepted your will and your plan perfectly, we can be saved. Thank you that in Jesus you have a plan for each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, not to judge anyone and not to judge ourselves. Help us to trust in your love and to give ourselves entirely to you. Help us to believe that you are a good God and that you are doing everything you can to save everyone that will be saved. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for accepting our imperfect worship and our imperfect words through the perfect word that created the worlds, through the blood of that word, because he became a man. Through Jesus we pray, amen. 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 Stand for our closing hymn, um, 216, when the roll is called up younger, number 216. <laughs> 